Whether you are creating home movies for fun, short videos to help promote your business, your own podcast, and it seems like everyone has one these days, or even if you are called upon to do some public speaking, some of the things I've learned from experience doing voiceover for hundreds of short and full-length documentary videos and dozens of commercials might be able to help you. So I've separated my voiceover tips into four categories. Equipment, environment, performance, and post-production. One, equipment. Of course you need a good microphone. I use a blue snowball. It costs about $50. I put it on a floor model mic stand so I can use it seated or standing, and I use a windscreen or pop filter. More about that in a second. So how do you know which mic is right for you? Well, the truth is that good voiceover is more about environment and performance our next two categories, than it is about equipment. The voiceover for many of my early videos was recorded through the simple onboard microphone that came with my computer, and it sounded okay because of my mic technique and speaking style. So definitely get the best mic you can afford, but don't break the bank. You will need to perfect your technique to make any mic sound good. A windscreen or pop filter can help too. That's a little mesh barrier you place between you and the microphone. It looks kind of like a piece of a woman's stocking stretched over a plastic ring about six inches across. You can find this stuff on Amazon, Best Buy, or B&H easily. But remember, unless you are making a feature film for theaters, how much you spend on your mic really doesn't matter that much. So let's move on to the things that do matter. Two, environment. Equally as important as the microphone you use is the chair you sit in. Well, not exactly the chair. It's where you put the seat that matters. The room you record in has a huge effect on the sound of your recording. You want the room to be as small as possible, with lots of soft furniture, rugs and draperies, to reduce the amount your voice bounces around the room. That bouncy sound is called reverberation, not echo, as many people erroneously call it. And it can make a voice recording sound unlistenable. Here's an example of what that sounds like. I'm now in the kitchen, second to the bathroom, probably the most reverberant room in the house and the place where most beginners choose to record. Tile floors and hard countertops bounce your voice around, making it no fun to listen to you. So pick a small bedroom, preferably carpeted. Wedge yourself into a corner and see if you can hang some big old beach towels on the walls or something else soft and absorbent. If you want to go to the next step, you can get acoustic foam, which are these large panels of soft foam about two feet square with ridges cut in them to absorb sound. You hang as many as you can on the walls and ceiling if you're really serious to dampen the ambient sound of the room. I have a bunch that really help with the sound of my space. I've even taken some and attached them to an old three-panel room divider that I drag close to me when I'm recording. When I pull it in close, it creates kind of a recording booth effect. The only problem is that these acoustic foam panels are expensive. If you don't have the budget, using towels, like I said, or even an old rug tacked to the wall works really well in conjunction with good mic technique, which I'll talk about next. Three, performance. Good mic technique is probably more important than either the microphone or the space, although I would not neglect those two things if at all possible. But you can certainly compensate for a bad space or a cheap mic with good technique. The first thing you need to know is that every microphone works better the closer you get to it. It's called the proximity effect, and it's what helps give radio announcers that deep punch in their voice, along with some electronic alteration, which we will talk about in the last section. Several things happen when you get close to your microphone. First, you begin to eliminate room sound. Even here, in my sound-controlled room, with acoustic foam and rugs surrounding me, if I pull away from the mic like this, 
you begin to hear more and more of the room. Partly because I have to speak more loudly, causing the sound to bounce around, like I mentioned before. Getting in close, like this, enables me to lower my voice, which does two things. It enhances the lower end, the bass, if you will, and gives my voice a subtler, whispering-in-your-ear kind of vibe. It's much more pleasing to the ear to hear the voice this way. However, you have to be careful not to get too close or breathe directly into the mic causing distortion and pops on some of the words. So turn your head slightly and talk past the mic and also get a pop filter or pop shield as I mentioned in the section on equipment. Now here comes the hardest and certainly the most important part of the performance. How you say the words. The first thing you need to be aware of when considering the quality of your voice is your breath. Even though you are close to the microphone and speaking somewhat quietly, you'll still need to take a big, deep breath down into your midsection or your diaphragm in order to give your voice power and give yourself enough stamina to finish long sentences like this one without a break. It's very difficult to explain how to lower the diaphragm, but it is this technique which gives opera singers power to reach the back of a huge auditorium without a microphone and will give you the amount of breath you need to get the read right. Now, I had singing lessons when I was younger, which helped, and I would recommend seeing a vocal coach if you are really serious about this. But all I can say is, if you take a deep breath and allow it to push your stomach out instead of your chest, you are pushing the diaphragm down. It's the difference between speaking like this and like this. This isn't my normal speaking voice. Like everyone else, when I'm engaged in everyday speaking, I don't speak from my diaphragm and use my announcer voice. That would be creepy. Like, excuse me, can you please tell me the price of these kumquats? That kind of speaking is only for the microphone, which is also why it's tough to do the announcer voice in public unless I get very close to the person's ear, which in itself would be even creepier. Once you have the breath down, the next thing to pay attention to is the inflection. Now, this is what gives meaning to the words and where it gets really tricky because each person will have a different way of reading a passage, and that's okay. But there are certain things I can show you about emphasis that will make your voiceover sound more professional and, most importantly, make what you are saying clearer to the listener. Let's take a short sample passage from an article about starting a fitness program. First, I will read it as most people would, with little inflection and little attention to the quality of my voice. Ever since I was a teenager, I've struggled with my weight. Not necessarily from a health perspective, I've always been pretty healthy, but I've struggled because I want to look better, feel more energetic, and get all of those great benefits that fitness offers. Pretty lousy, right? Now let's look this over and find some, what I call, keywords. That is, what are the important words in the sentences, the ones that need to be emphasized a little? In the first sentence, I think struggled is the most important word. Ever since I was a teenager, I've struggled with my weight. The next sentence has to start at a higher pitch to signify that it's making a slight correction to the previous statement, like this. Not necessarily from a health perspective, then come down for the second half without a conclusion. I've always been pretty healthy, and when you hit the word struggle again, but I've struggled because you give it a slight emphasis to indicate that it's connected to the first struggle. In other words, an intentional repeat. Then we have a list, and each one of those things in the list needs to be handled slightly differently. I want to look better, well, that's clearly not the end of a sentence. So hit a mid-note, but still not resolve. Feel more energetic, then land firmly. And get all of those great benefits that fitness offers. So now let's try it all at once. Ever since I was a teenager, I've struggled with my weight. Not necessarily from a health perspective. I've always been pretty healthy. But I've struggled because I want to look better, feel more energetic, and get all of those great benefits that fitness offers. 
Now, you don't want to push all of this too far, or you'll end up sounding like one of those late-night commercials selling amazing knife sets or non-stick cookware. Burnt milk is a kitchen disaster. You might as well throw the pan away. But with Armor Coat, this mess just peels right off. Wait, there's more. The trick is to find your level of emphasis, and always keep in mind that you are trying to make what you are reading as easily comprehensible to the listener as you can. That's really the bottom line, and what all of this is for. 4. Post-Production Once you have your best performances recorded, you edit out all the mistakes. I stop and start many times. I almost never read anything all the way through without stopping and trying a line here or there a few times. With certain lines, I may do up to five takes. But if you can't get it after five takes, usually you just need to slow down a little or maybe need to practice a certain difficult word or phrase several times before proceeding. Anyway, once you have a perfected performance, it can be enhanced a bit with compression and EQ. Most programs have the ability to compress audio, and all that means is bringing the softer things up in volume while bringing the louder things down so that the entire performance is more uniform, volume-wise. Then tweak the equalization, pushing the lower register up a little if the bass doesn't feel strong enough. Again, every program works differently, so that's why I'm not getting into the particulars of how to do it. That's something you will have to research depending on the application you use to record sound, but it's one of the ways to get that fat, thick radio sound we are all used to hearing. It may take a little trial and error to get the settings just right, but once you have them, you should be able to save the settings and use those every time you record. Lastly, compare what you have done to voices that you like. I mean, really listen to yourself in comparison to the vocal performances that really turn you on, and then try again. Be honest with yourself. Does the recording fall short of your ideal? How and why? And what do you need to do to fix it? This time, there are two. Terminator 2. So those are my quick tips for voiceover beginners. Now this is based on my personal experience and is far from a comprehensive look at all the topics you can discover about the challenges of this particular performance art. But this overview will at least give you a good start. Good luck.